Hello, madam. Yeah. yeah. Can yes. we start? Yes. 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 Sir, can we start? Professor Boparachi, can we start? Hello. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Marinita. Yes, yes, yes. Namaskar and good evening, everybody. And welcome to this 40th Kane Memorial Lecture, which is very prestigious of the kind set up by the Asiatic Society of Mumbai in the fond memory of the Bharat Ratna Mahamohopadhyay, Dr. P. V. Kane. Today's a distinguished scholar, Professor Osman Boporachi, will be enlightening us on study of trade in Indian Ocean through self-portraits of traders with particular reference to the murals of Maharashtra. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce to this August audience our today's distinguished scholar, Professor Osman Boparachi. Professor Boparachi is the Emeritus, <clears throat> Emeritus Director of Research of the French National Center for Scientific Research former adjunct professor of Central and South Asian Art, Archaeology and Numismatics, University of California, Berkeley, and former visiting professor and member of the Doctoral School of the Paris Sorbonne University. In him, there is a fine blending of a numismatist, art historian, and archaeologist. He has authored 17 books five exhibition catalogs, two translations of books, and he is the editor of six volumes. He is, to his credit, he has to his credit, 14 book reviews, 143 research articles in reputed international journals. He has presented 92 papers at International Colloquia, presented 275 conferences in 80 cities and has carried out 120 archaeological missions in 24 different countries. Professor Boparachi holds BA from the University of Kelania, Sri Lanka and BA honors MA MPhil PhD from the Paris 1 Sorbonne University and a higher doctorate habilitation, habilitation from Paris 4 Sorbonne University. No wonder that he is the recipient of prestigious international awards. French Academy bestowed most prestigious awards to five of his books and George Perrett Medley being the most distinguished one. Indian Coin Society attributed the Bhagwan Lal Indraji Silver Medal for his first book written in French on greco bactrian and Indo-Greek coins published by the French National Library. In recognition of his contribution to South Indian numismatics, he was offered the silver medal in honor of Dr. P. L. Gupta by the South Indian Numismatic Society in January 2006. In recognition of his contribution to the Greek numismatics, he was offered silver medal of the Hellenic Numismatic Society. He was elevated to the position of the Order of Academic Palms by the French government and the Order of Contestine the Great by the Greek government. In 2020, that is last year, he published three books. 
Roots of Sri Lankan Art, published by the Department of Archaeology, Colombo. Second one, From Hindu Kush to Salt Range. He is the co-author of this book, published by Ink Beyond Imagination, Kolkata. And third one, When West Met East, Gandharan Art Revisited, published by Munshiram Manoharlal, Delhi. This book, When West Met East, this book received the Distinguished Aikyo Hiriyama Award attributed by the French Academy. On behalf of Kane Research Institute, Asiatic Society of Mumbai, and all the listeners, I extend a warm welcome to Professor Boparachi. Friends, to preside over this Kane Memorial Lecture, we have another servant of art among us, that is Dr. Deepak Kannal. Dr. Deepak Kannal, a former professor in art history and aesthetics and in charge head department of sculpture, MS University of Baroda, where he was also the Dean of Faculty of Fine Arts from 2003 to 2009. He has to his credit, a postdoctoral project on Amravati sculpture in British Museum, London, as a Charles Wallace Fellow, Cambridge, in 1992. Dr. Kannan has bagged a number of awards, such as Gujarat State Lalita Kala Award for Sculpture in 1971-74, National Lalita Kala Academy in 1976, AP Council National Biennial Award in 1978, Gujarat State Lalita Kala Gaurav Puraskar in 2013, Raja Ravi Verma Sanman in 2016, and Tagore National Fellowship in 2019, and so on. Among his books, a mention must be made of Elora and Enigma in Sculpture Studies. The first edition was in 1994, and in 2018, the second edition of this book has been published. He is the co author of Vaishnavism in Indian Art and Culture. He is the co-editor and contributor of Ajantha New Perspectives in two volumes and Elora Cave Sculptures and Architecture, the second edition of which has come out in 2019, that is last year. Dr. Kannal is the editor of Samvada and Nirukta, Journal of Art History and Aesthetics. And this Nirukta has been founded by University Grants Commissions. Besides this, he has contributed 75 scholarly articles and has authored a number of reviews of art exhibitions and art catalogs. For Sculptors Forum of India, he has organized exhibition all over India and also in USA. <clears throat> Dr. Kannal, I also give you a warm welcome for this prestigious Kane Memorial Lecture. Uh, we are very soon now going to hear Professor Boporachi. Professor Boporachi will speak approximately 50 to 55 minutes, followed by question answer session, if any, and then Dr. Kannan will give his presidential remarks. So with this introduction, I uh, request Dr. Kannan to take the charge of the proceedings of this Kane Memorial Lecture Program and request Professor Parachi to initiate his interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, can you all see the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, um, Try to see the full screen. Okay, uh, so you can see the full screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Dr. Panita Deshpande, for your introduction. Uh, distinguished uh, colleagues, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I wish to express my deep gratitude once again to the Kane Research Institute. Asiatic Society of Mumbai 
for inviting me to deliver the 40th Kane Memorial online lecture. In this regard, my sincere thanks goes to Dr. Parnita Deshpande, Honorable Director, not only for the kind invitation, but also for taking care of all the logistics. I also express my gratitude to her for not being discouraged by the technical problems we faced last time and in between. I also take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Usha Vijayalakshmi, Official Honorary Secretary. Uh, dear Professor Deepak Kannal, you have honored me by accepting again to chair this event. As I told you last time, although I have not met you personally, I have read your scholarly works. You are a well-known Indian art historian, sculptor. Furthermore, you are the former professor of the Department of Art History and Aesthetics, Faculty of Fine Arts, um, MA University of Baroda, Gujarat, and former Dean and the head of the department. Um, your book on Elora Caves entitled Elora, an enigma in sculptured, uh, sculptural styles is a great scholarly contribution. Your recent book on master sculptors of ancient India is also a landmark in Indian art history. So thank you very much, Honorable Sir, for accepting to chair this important event. I am extremely pleased to deliver today's talk in honor of one of India's greatest scholars, Dr. P. Varman Kane. Dr. Kane is a world-renowned Indologist and Sanskritist. He was crowned with India's highest civilian award, Bharat Ratna. Students of Sanskrit all over the world know about his monumental magnum opus, the history of Dharma Shastra. He was indeed a distinguished scholar of Sanskrit and Indology and had to had, uh, to his credit 19 books and monographs, 66 articles, 34 review articles. His literary output measured over 15,000 printed pages. Okay. He has set an example to young Sanskritists oh, and Indologists. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. So both maritime Please, and you Indian... put your phones or uh, laptops. Some sounds are heard. Thank you. Yeah. So both maritime and inland trade brought peoples of many cultures, languages, beliefs, and aesthetics, aspirations together. Traders were to a certain extent the mediators of these cultural interactions because Buddhist monks and nuns, philosophers, artists, and diplomats traveled together across merchant networks. As a result, not only goods, but also philosophical thoughts, ideas, and artistic traditions were exchanged. Buddhism like Jainism favored profit-based trade more than Hinduism which actively discouraged seafaring. For example, in Buddhayana Sutra, one of the Dharma Shastras, um, uh, or texts that deal with law and conduct, quite explicitly states that making voyages by sea and trading in all sorts of merchandise are sins leading to the loss of the caste. The important archaeological evidence, in particular coins, metal, gold, silver, bronze, and iron, ceramics, pottery and amphorae, glass, wares, beads and jewelry, seals and ceilings, among others, helps us to understand the growth of trade activities. Since Buddhism actively encouraged trade and invited donations by rich merchants, the study of Buddhist iconography can make an important contribution to this discussion. Aside from hundreds of inscriptions, detailing those contributions and Buddhist texts, praising merchants who supported Buddhist complexes, the Buddhist visual culture in the form of paintings and sculptures can help us to evaluate the dynamics of trade and the chronological and geographical orientations of roots. My today's talk will focus on the symbiotic relationship between Buddhism and trade in ancient South Asia with special reference to Maharashtra. 
examination of this relationship will underscored will be underscored by textual narratives as well as archaeological and art historical research across the regions it will demonstrate how images and associated symbols can be seen as the visual manifestations of social commercial and religious networks and will illuminate patterns of circulation and exchange with india's west coast in particular and more broadly across the indian ocean it will outline how from its early history buddhism was closely linked with the merchant class which came to support buddhist monasteries and other institutions buddhist communities were established along the trade routes linking important political and economic centers where they provided hospitality for merchants and other travelers this position buddhist practice to spread dramatically as merchants with the buddhist tradition expanded the geographical range of their commercial activities the growth of the maritime mercantile networks in particular facilitated the movement of buddhism from india to sri lanka and then to southeast asia within this process buddhism was not merely a passive recipient of the generosity of the merchant class but actively promoted itself as protector of trade as mediated through rich textual and visual narratives and the development of divine cults thanks to literary sources and archaeological evidence we know to a certain extent the identities of mariners traders and merchants who ventured across the indian ocean as the trade routes evolved from coastal to direct navigation and this destinations fluctuated according to the decline or rise of political powers the makeup of merchant communities also changed some buddhist mural paintings and sculptures enable us to guess their identity like today's selfies these generous traders lift their portraits in the buddhist art uh, sponsored by them the inseparable link between buddhism and merchant communities is demonstrated by buddhist textual and visual narratives the link is self evident in epithets for the buddha in vipura yoga the previous birth story written in gandhari and translated by timothy lens it is said that the buddha was a merchant a samudra vanija of the great ocean mahasamudra and he set out the uh, on the uh, great ocean with supplies collected by him most importantly however are the references in buddhist literature one such example is found in nidana katha by buddha gosha composed in the 5th century ce in sri lanka in this work the author praises a generous gift by anatha pindika the wealthiest merchants in shravasti during the time of the historical buddha as one in a long string of pious gifts made by merchants to the buddhas of the past in the story anatha pindika purchases a jetwana park for the blessed one by covering it with gold coins so all of you know about the baharuts uh, about this sculpture which has a, a, a inscription uh, i mean preferring to the donation by anatha pindika and if you go to great sanchi stupa in the northern uh, northern torena where you can still see the coins underneath and also the kutis made for buddha and others the most important discovery with this regard was made in kanaganhalli in karnataka which was excavated quite recently between 1994 and 98 and 2000 2002 and among these sculptures there were two depicting the donations donation of the jetavana by anatha pindika and of course the inscriptional uh, evidence uh, with, uh, um, uh, goes with it so here we have one where the buildings are also inscribed so there is one for bhagavato which is the house or the vihara of the lord meaning the buddha and also there is one for ayas anandas in genitive of the venerable ananda his disciple and also there is a kuti 
of the Venerable Rahul, Buddha's son, who became a man. And then we have Kausambaputi. Of course, we have plenty of evidence for that. And also we, there is a walking path because inside the Jetavana there was a walking path and also a well. So it is a complete monastery that you can see here and also um, with the cart and also appearance of Anatha Pindika uh, in Anjali Mudra on our right hand side. So the popularity of the Anatha Pindika story in Buddhist literature and art could well be interpreted as an advertisement encouraging other wealthy merchants to engage in the same kind of meritorious acts, setting the stage for the development of a mutual relationship that would stimulate the movement of Buddhism along the networks of trade. The spread of Buddhism from South Asia to Southeast Asia is closely connected with the growth of maritime and fluvial networks whose flourishing inland and international trade centers were located in ports along the coast and navigable rivers. The distribution patterns of the early Buddhist settlements active during the last two centuries before the common era and the, five uh, the first five centuries of the common era show they were inland and clustered around the big rivers flowing to the Indian Ocean. The location of Emporia along the rivers further facilitated transactions with the interior regions. So this is what we see. The, the land routes were very, very expensive. Um, and you can see here, these are some photographs taken in the 19th century where the famous company Lipton used the globe cars to transport the tea. But the fluvial transportation at that time, I mean, referring to not only the 19th century, but also, I mean, referring to the early stage, third century BC, second century, uh, fifth century CE period, was less dangerous and less expensive than the land routes. So if you look at most of most important Indian um, uh, clusters of Buddhist complexes going to Gandhara, uh, to the, in today's Pakistan, and it is in the Upper Indus Valley with the tributaries of Suat and Kabul rivers. There are hundreds and hundreds of Buddhist monasteries connected with the Indus River, and Indus River uh, was connected to the Indian Ocean with, um, uh, at Karachi. And then if you take the Middle Gangetic River, and as you know, it's a very long river, 2,525 uh, uh, kilometers long, all the well-known uh, Buddhist sites like uh, Buddhaya, Varnasi, Sarnath, Vaishali, they are all situated either in the Yamuna, Ganges, or um, uh, Neeranjana and other rivers. Same thing happens uh, in the first, second, third centuries and fourth centuries in Andhra Pradesh. Most of the famous Andhra Buddhist sites like Amaravati, Nagarjunukonda, Jakpitaya, Panigiri and all the other sites, they are all connected with the Krishna River. Same thing can be seen in Sri Lanka, the capital, which was for about 14th centuries active capital. And it is connected, it's inland, connected with uh, Mantai, the famous port with the Arivyaru or Malvatu River. The one of the reasons why Chola dynasty preferred Polonnaruwa to be the capital, and when they abandoned Anuradhapura, because Polonnaruwa is connected with Trincomalee, which is the world's fifth largest natural port. And this was a period by the 10th and 11th centuries, the focus of the trade was towards the Southeast Asia. So this was the, the best place to do the trade. And if you go to Myanmar, and especially a river like Irrawaddy, which is 2,210 kilometers long and still navigable, I mean, not only up to Pagan, but also Mandalay and beyond. And it, it, it makes the inland trade uh, quite easy uh, with this uh, river. And of course, we know in Pagan, there are over 3000 Buddhist monuments and just on the uh, left bank of the Irrawaddy River. Same thing in Thailand, we have Chaviyupriya River, which is not very long, but it connected all the ancient capitals of Thailand, Ayutthaya and others. Same thing in Java with Progo River, and we have Chandimendu, Chandipagan, and uh, Chandipawan, and also Borobudur. They are all connected with the same river. But there is an exception. 
The prosperity and longevity of this Buddhist monastic site depended mainly on the dynamics of maritime and fluvial trade because traders as major donors played an immeasurable role in the construct construction of the maintenance of monastic complexes and as such in the spread of Buddhism. Only the widespread and gigantic Buddhist cave complexes of the Deccan Plateau in Maharashtra in Western India are an exception because the traders who sponsored these sumptuous dwellings of the Buddhist monks followed land routes. The Western Ghats been too close to the literal. There aren't major rivers falling into the Arabian Sea. Instead, they all flow eastwards among these Godavari and the Krishna River hold an important place. If you look at a map, this is what you see. The, the two important rivers, I mean, of course, including Bhima, which is a tributary of Krishna, um, uh, and also Godavari, and they all go towards the, um, the east side, not the west side. So the, um, the traders used uh, uh, the pass, Nanigat Pass, where I had the pleasure of uh, visiting the place with Professor Manjiri. I'm very grateful to her. And these photographs were taken during this visit. Even today, people use this route, and which is a land route. And, um, uh, and, and of course, Narigat meaning the pass for the coins. And also we know about the inscription um, here and also the sculptures which were there. So we, this was an important point, uh, which is quite different from all the other Buddhist complexes of India. I'm referring to Gandhara, Andhra Pradesh, Middle Gangetic Valley, Sri Lanka, and also Southeast Asia. All of them are linked with the rivers except Maharashtra. So this is the reason why, and only in Maharashtra with an one exception in Orissa, where you have the depictions of Ashtamaha Bear Avalokiteshwar. The fear of the unknown gave birth to the legends of ferocious Yakshas, Rakshas, and Pretas. The sculptures depicting the Ashtamaha Bear Avalokiteshwar evoke the dangerous land routes and the constant fear of shipwrecks. Buddhist visual narratives sponsored by trader donors can thus be seen as appeals for the protection from the blessed ones to reach their home safely and represent an often overlooked but essential part of the study of maritime trade. So I'm taken to the most well-preserved Ashrama Abhya, which is in Aurangabad caves and cave number seven on our left hand side, we can see it. So right in the middle, you have Avalokiteshwara with Amitabha in the Jatamakuta and also holding the lotus, which is the flower of excel, par excellence of Avalokiteshwara. And he appears eight times on either side. The presence of many depictions of the so-called Ashrama Abhya, the eight great perils, Avalokiteshwara in Maharashtra's cave complexes in Western India clearly demonstrates that traders taking the dangerous land routes needed the Bodhisattva's protection against enraged animals, poisonous reptiles, wild beasts, evil spirits, captivity and slavery, the sword of the enemy and the devouring fire. Out of eight perils, one is dedicated to seafarers who face the danger in the turbulent ocean. Of course, they all they, they were traders who used the uh, uh, ocean or uh, uh, Indian Ocean trade routes. But from there, I mean, they when they came to the other, I mean, seaports, they went inland and they had to encounter these dangers. So it says in the Sadharma Pundarika, when a caravan leader travels on a dangerous road together with his fellow merchants carrying precious treasures in a great manifold cosmos filled with evil robbers. If there be a single person who says, O oh sons of a virtuous family, do not fear. You should wholeheartedly chant the name of Bodhisattva Aurigateshwar. This Bodhisattva bestows fearlessness upon sentient beings. If you chant his name, you will be free from all these evil robbers. So this is what you see in Ashrama Abhya. So first of all, we have the enraged animals with the lion attacking traders. So if you utter the name of Aluk Seshura, he will come, as you can see here, and save the traders. 
And then we have the poisonous reptiles. They can be lizards, snakes, vipers, scorpions. So here we have two cobras in front of, behind two merchants and the intervention of Arugiteshwar. And then the wild bees. Of course, in Indian forest, apart from lions and reptiles, then we have wild elephants. So we have a wild elephant emerging from the forest and, and they are praying to Arugiteshwar. And then we have the evil spirits and demons. Of course, the fear of yakshas, rakshas, and the demons is one. So if you meet evil rakshas, poisonous dragons, and demons, if you contemplate the power of Arupiteshwara, they will not dare to hurt you. And then, of course, there is one, as I said, for the shipwrecks, because this is one of the dangers that the traders had to face. So even if a cyclone were blow the ship of one of these towards the land of raksha demons, they would all become free from danger of those rakshas demons and raksha demons if there were even a single person among them who chanted the name of Bodhisattva Aurikuteshwara. And then we have the captivity. When you travel, which is not a really a danger if you take the, um, the fluvial route, but if you take the land route, this is one of the, another danger, the captivity and the slavery and also the sword of the enemy, meaning the robbers. So every time if you can encounter these difficulties, either animals or human beings or demons or devouring fire in the forest, there's something that you have to encounter which you may not encounter when you take the river. So again, the Aulipitesha will come and save you. So you have to, I'm, I'm not going to show you all of them. They are in Ajanta Caves and also in Kaneri. Um, this is one the closest cave. And then of course, cave number 92, a very beautiful depiction of a lion attacking the trader and the cobras attacking. And on the other side, we have the evil spirits. Now, this reputation of Aurupiteshwara around the seventh and eighth centuries, protecting traders who are taking the ocean and also the land routes uh, was had a repute, also had the reputation in the Silk Road crossing the uh, uh, modern day China. So I'm, I'm taking you to Mogao cave number 14, where you have a depiction of Aulukiteshwara and around it, all the dangers that the traders have to face because they had to take, there were no rivers, they only took the land road and sometimes in the right in the middle of the desert. So this is exactly what they encountered leopards, the snow leopards that you, uh, so the trade is running away from the leopard. And then of course the captivity and slavery. Um, and then of course evil spirits, the demons, and also the devouring fire. And then of course cyclones and shipwrecks. So this is something which started in Maharashtra. I also traveled along the Silk Road, I mean up to Siyan and beyond and also in you can see that in Mogao caves. Um, um, uh, so uh, this is what you see. Uh, compare um, when you compare the risks that one would encounter taking the fluvial routes. The ones the the risk that you have to encounter when you take the land route is worse. So this is why uh, the Ashtama Abhyavadhutesha became popular only in Maharashtra. The only so here we are the four. I mean, eight encounters on either side. The only place I can think of, I mean, I'd be very happy if somebody can correct me, where you can see the Ashtama apart from Maharashtra is in Orissa, uh, the discovery made um, um, made in Ratnagiri in, in Odisha, where you have Tara in the middle and the eight perils. So something, so Maharashtra is extremely important when we talk about the, um, um, the trade, especially inland trade. And also this reputation, as you know, Mahajanaka Jataka, the goddess Manikela saves Mahajanaka from drowning and she protects good people, particularly good Buddhists, good Buddhists from the perils. So this is a Thai painting. And also the reputation of Guanyin, which is the female appearance of Alugiteshwara itself, not only in Southeast Asia, but also in China and also in Japan and also in Korea. So they, they are all linked with the traders, um, ocean going and the land going. 
The choice of Jataka and Avadana stories depicted in paintings and reliefs of Ajanta Ellora Borobudur Pagan and many other Buddhist complexes reflects the aspirations of donors who sponsored them. The stories connected with the fear of sea monsters and terrestrial demons, so Yakshas, Rakshas, and Pretas were the major threats and enemies of the mariners who ventured into the perilous ocean and dangerous foreign lands in search of wealth. So I'm taking you to Ajanta cave number 17, where you have the story of Singhala, as, I mean, which has several versions and is known as the Valhasa or the, uh, the cloud host Jataka in the Jataka Mala, as the Dharmala of the Jataka in the Mahavastu, and the Singhala Avadana in the Divya Avadana, as well as in many later versions, such as uh, ones from Jain and Nepali traditions, respectively. So, so this is how you see the whole painting covers um, the one wall here. Um, uh, and uh, this is a drawing um, uh, given to me by uh, my good friend, Professor Monica Singh. Um, and also this was published in the uh, Shing Globe's book, where you have the order, which is quite complex way of narrating the story. Uh, and this is how uh, the, the arrows go according to the chronological order. So first we see here, the story as narrated in Jatakamala partly takes place on the island of the Rakshasi, who take human forms to attract groups of seafarers who have survived the shipwreck. So here we have the shipwreck, and then we have these Rakshasis as beautiful women. I mean, these are wonderful paintings. And of course, the, the trade leader is here with a beautiful woman, and also others have, I mean, they are also flirting, and they have their uh, time with these uh, beautiful ladies. But according to Valhasa Jataka, a virtuous merchant leader quickly realized at night that these beautiful women were rakshis who eat humans or cast them into a house of torment. Unfortunately, in Ajanta, this part is broken. I mean, uh, I mean, it's not visible, but we can get an idea from uh, this sculpture, which, which is now in the Indian Museum of Calcutta, but came from Mathura of the Kushana period. On the back side of it, we can see the merchant leader climbing a tree and finds the, the tower of Terment where the traders were imprisoned by the Rakshis. So then in the morning, he warns his men about the danger and proposes an escape from the Ogres' island. Some who were seduced by their beauty and had become their husbands refused the chief's proposal while the others accepted to run away. So at that, at that moment, Bodhisattva identified as Audhupiteshwara in later Mahayana versions, not early ones, possessing supernatural powers appears in front of them as a flying horse, rescues the mariners and takes them home safely. In the Jatakamala, the story ends here. So here we have the, the horse and also the way how the traders, not all of them, some of them escaped. And here you have the women crying. Of course, you know the story, asking them to stay because now they have their children. But others left and some fell down. And uh, here you can see from the same sculpture, hanging onto the horse. And then those who fell down were eaten by the ogresses, uh, the, the Rakshasis. And, and this is a, a, a wonderful painting. And then we go to the other squares as there. So in the Mahavastu version, the story does not include the intervention of the flying horse. Instead, the merchant leader, now named Dharmalabdha, continues his journey back home only to be followed by a Rakshasi who pretends to be his wife and have given birth to his child. The malignant spirit was able to convince the villagers of these rules. Ultimately, when she appears in front of the king, who wished to find a solution to the problem, the king was seduced by her beauty despite the warning of Dharmalabdha. So this is what we see, the arrival of the uh, Rakshasi here, and then of the encounter with the king. And you can see she's coming from here and then the king. And, and then you can see the, uh, the Yakshi 
uh, with the child pretending that uh, the child is uh, the um, trade leader's son. And then at night, the Rakshasi, so of course, the king went back to the palace with the Rakshasi, ate the king and everyone in the palace. Finally, Dharmalabdha was anointed king uh, because no Yaksha or Raksha was able to tempt him. So this is what you see, the attack of the Rakshasis inside the, uh, the palace because the, the woman asked the other Rakshasis to come. So they killed the king um, and everyone in the entourage. And fortunately, the, uh, the Bodhisattva now in this stage uh, rescued all of them. And because as a gratitude for his I mean, heroic act, he was anointed the king. The story of Dharmaratta narrated in the Mahavastu was expanded once more in Divyavadana. The Simhala, the merchant leader who finally became the king, waged a war against the Rakshasis of the island. The troops mounted on horses and elephants, boarded ships heading for the island. The defeated Rakshasis were compelled to ask for forgiveness from the king Singhala. So this is what you see here, the army. And also, I mean, of course, these are on horseback. And then you have the attack of the Rakshasis. The story, of course, is, uh, is a very reminiscent of the legendary arrival of Vijaya to Lanka, who was also a merchant in search of, search of new markets with 500 followers when Yakshini Queen was ruling the island. So this is a wonderful um, uh, 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 image or painting of that legend combining three stories together. And it is a legend of the merchant, seagoing merchants. So I'm taking you to, I can't talk about everything, but I've just show you some interesting ones. For example, if you go to Sanchi, the east face of the Torana, um, and here we have uh, 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 traders seated on Bactrian camels. As you know, the Bactrian camel, also known as Mongolian camel, to the steppes of Central Asia, it has two arms compared to the other um, the Egyptian and other, other camels. So you have two traders, maybe the, those who sponsored part of the Sanchi uh, Torana or, or the Sanchi East Torana. And the, most interestingly, and you can see the person on, uh, on the goat. Uh, he's not an Indian because he's not dressed like, and his hair, it's almost like a Greek. It could be Agathocles, it could be Seleucus, but it's a Greek merchant, and he's dressed like a Greek, and he's wearing boots. So again, we have an image of a Greek um, in, uh, in Sanchi. And now I take you quickly to Sanchi number one, North Torana, where you have in the inner face uh, the tributes paid by the Scythians uh, to the Sanchi stupa. When you look at them, they, are, they don't look like Indians, they look like uh, Scythians. So they could be traders who have come to venerate the stupa with presents. And also, uh, this is a wonderful um, illustration of musical instruments of that time. Of course, um, um, I'll show you some of them. Um, so you have the trump uh, trumpets as well, and they have this typical Scythian uh, a Scythian cap on their head. So they are not Indians. They should have come from Bactria or from uh, Gandhara uh, in Afghanistan and today's Pakistan. And the double flute, which is a Greek flute um, uh, that you can see, of course, later, um, I mean, adapted by the Indians. And then, of course, double faced drums, single faced drums, and also this instrument, which I think I may, I may not be correct, but the a guiro, a Latin American percussion instrument consisting of an open-ended hollow gourd with parallel notches cut in, uh, cut in one, uh, one side. So th this gives you a wonderful illustration of a foreign delegation who may have come with presents and money to the, uh, to the stupa. Although the great stupas of Amaravati, Kanaganhali, Nagarjunukonda, and many others in the Krishna Valley they are witness to the political and economic supremacy of the respective ruling dynasties. The glorification of these monuments certainly underscores the religious motivations of the local Buddhist population for the construction of, uh, construction of the Krishna Valley cultic sites. Resources needed for the construction and embellishment would have become, would have been provided by dual Buddhist mercantile classes who were well-established in cities like 
Bhandi Katipu, Dharani Kota, the capital of the Sathavan dynasty in the early centuries of the common era. The great quantities of foreign glassware, pottery of Western types, Mediterranean amphorae used as wine and olive containers and Roman gold coins representing bullion trade uncovered in the distribution centers along the Krishna River indicate flourishing domestic and international trade. I take one example uh, from Amravati here. This is a depiction um, of a um, uh, 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 Sutta. Uh, in um, uh, uh, the story of King uh, Banduma of Bandumati, who received two presents consisting of costly bread, wealth, and a precious sandalwood. He distributed them to his two daughters. They in turn offered them to the Buddha in his previous incarnation as Vipassi. Because of this, in their later rebirth, the elder of the two princes was born as Mahade Maya Devi, mother of Bodhisattva Gautama, and the other, the younger, uh, attained sentiment. So here we have on the sculpture, King Seated, and the two daughters on our left-hand side. The, here uh, on below, you have the, below the king's throne are the pages offering the presents. So look at them. These are Indians. They are dressed like Indians of that period, and they are not dressed like Indians. And these are foreign traders. If you look very carefully, um, one looks like a Roman trader, and other one, without any doubt, is dressed differently, could be an Ethiopian. So these were the traders who would have come from Egypt, uh, from the Red Sea, um, um, today's Ethiopia and, and Egypt. So this gives you, I mean, it's, I don't go to the extent saying that this is a true portrait of the traders who donated money. But at least this gives you an idea of the traders who were involved in trade in the Krishna Valley. This is the reason why so many um, uh, Roman coins and glassware and foray were found in, the, uh, uh, in this area. Um, I'm taking you to Sri Lanka just for distraction uh, to this, uh, uh, the stupa built in the first century BCE uh, uh, and to the Ayaka. And we know the four ayakas or the Vahalkadas, as they say it in Sinhalese, the frontispieces were built in the second century because of the inscription written in Brahmi here. So uh, this one has a very interesting depiction that nobody ever understood, which is a Kalpa Vuksha in the form of a candelabrum, that means a candle tree, right? And what you see here, uh, the two male figures have the wings and curly hair of Roman cupids. This type of cupid is quite common in Roman art, especially on the paintings of Pompeii, which can be dated without any difficulty to the first century, if not before. So what you have here, here are two cupids. And then we have the winged lions have bird-like face reminding us of griffins. If you follow, uh, if we, as we know, the gryphon or griffin or griffon drawing from Greek gryfho and Latin gryphus is a legendary creature uh, with the body, tail and back legs of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle. Such griffins are also common once again in the paintings of Pope. And then the whole thing uh, which is which became a symbol of Sri Lankan Nayaka sculptures is a candelabrum which is a Sri Lankan version of the Roman candelabrum or the candle tree with uh, stylized acanthus leaves. I mean, just to tell you that acanthus, the plant doesn't grow in Sri Lanka. But Pliny the Elder, who was born in 23 CE and died tragically in 79 CE during the eruption of the Mount Vesuvius, described in his natural history how a Sri Lankan king sent an embassy from known as Taprobani to the Greek to Rome, sometime during the reign of Emperor Claudius, who ruled from 51 to 54 CE. The embassy occurred, uh, 41 to 54, the embassy occurred at the same time as the accidental arrival to Sri Lanka of a Roman freedman named Anius Plocamus. This era thus saw the beginning of direct Roman contact with Sri Lanka. It is striking to note that recent research carried out by Italian archaeologists 
on the mummy of Grotta Rossa that uh, of an eight-year-old girl found 11 kilometers from Via Cassia in the north of Rome testifies to the trade between Rome and Sri Lanka. So this is a sarcophagus and the mummy that they found. And on our right-hand side is the tomb, which was excavated as early as 1925. The child's body placed in sarcophagus, decorated with hunting scenes, inspired by an uh, episode of the book four of the uh, An Aid. So this is the episode. It is currently preserved in the National Museum at Palazzo Massimo in Rome. Near the mummy were served several other artifacts, an ivory doll with articulated arms and legs, gold earrings, a gold ring adorned with wing victory, small red amber vases and small amulets. The mummy wore a fine tunic Chinese silk and a gold necklace adorned with 13 blue sapphires. Italian archaeologists and gemologists concluded that the blue sapphires came from Sri Lanka. The decoration of the sarcophagus and the analysis of the offerings led, to the led the archaeologists to take the tomb to the second half of the second century CE. So no wonder why in Sri Lanka that you find Roman motifs in a stupa. Uh, I will insist further, now I take you back to Andhra Pradesh, that before the Sassanian entered the Indian trade, Parthians, Scythians, and Kushans were active during the first three centuries of the common era. The pillar from the site number 37 at Nagarjunakunda is discussed now. So here you have a happy uh, Ghana figure playing the drum. And then you have this figure and underneath you have uh, women dancing uh, completely drunk. The Scythian wearing a long sleeve tunic over the tight trousers belted at the waist and wearing a Phrygian cap. He holds a drinking cup the function of which can be understood looking at the lower register where three women dance in front of two containers. So here we have a Scythian. This is what you call a Phrygian cap. The Indians normally don't wear this, only the Phrygians do. And he's dressed like a Phrygian with, the, with this typical beard. And of course, the, the sculpture on our left-hand side is from Gandhara, now in Japan. And then we have the Scythian here. And then we have these three women dancing. Of course, these are containers of alcohol, so they are drunk. And then also we have men, again, drinking. And then the two depictions of men wearing a knee-length, long-sleeved, high-collar tunic belted around the waist and worn over baggy trousers, what we call shalwar kamish, with horizontal folds to the ankles and, and holding long spear, look more like kushans. Why I say they are kushans? because of this sleeved tunic that he is wearing. On our left-hand side, I'm showing you a sculpture from Gandhara. Right in the middle, you have Buddha standing. And on either side, you have two, either two Kushan kings or Kushan nobles. And this is what we call the long sleeves. And if you just drop it, it will drop down. And this was used for dancing. So, I mean, you can imagine it. And the Kushan here, certainly the trader who finance this, um, uh, the column is, uh, um, uh, we are in the same tunic. And again, a man seated on a couch served by a woman. The containers under the couch are certainly meant for alcohol. Either they, they could be toddy, a local alcohol or wine from, uh, from, from the Mediterranean world. No wonder why so many amphorae containing the wine found in South India, in particular in Patinam, on the Periyar Delta in Kerala, as well as in Narakamedu and from the sites lower Krishna Valley. I'm just drawing you the chart drawn by Robert Tatomba, the, the best specialist of Amphori today. And these are, these are from Pactinum. So there were so many varieties of uh, Amphori coming from uh, Spain, from France, from Tunisia, from Rome and everywhere. Now I'm taking you to again to Ajanta Cave number one. I spoke to you about Roman traders. I spoke to you about Scythian and Kushans. Now I'm going to uh, trace the Persians. The Persians were quite active uh, in the fifth and the sixth centuries of the common era. So cave number one on the ceiling, you all know about this. These are uh, the, the depictions of Persian looking uh, people. So 
I adapt the um, hypothesis by my good friend Monica Sin. At Ajanta, the male figure seated in the middle of the scene of a scene represented on the ceiling of the cave number one, holding a wine drinking cup and surrounded by his entourage, has been identified by Monica Sin as Kubera, one of the Chatura Maharajikas, four great kings of four directions, and the king of the north. He is shown dressed in Persian garb and long tunic belted at the west. Um, what is interesting in this painting is the fluttering streamers or beribbon ribbons, which, is, uh, which was very popular during the Sassanian period and the Persians. The fluttering streamers emanating behind the head immedi immediately evoke depictions of Sassanian kings in ancient Persian art. Many Sassanian reliefs depict the supreme being, Auramazda, investing the ruler by handing him a beribbon diadem. On the relief of uh, Nashri Rabab in Iran, Auramazda hands the beribbon diadem to Sassanian king Ardashir I. The same iconography can be seen on the coins of Ardashir I and his successors like Shapur, I'll come to that. And here, these are the plates where you can see the Sassanian king. These are hunting scenes. And here we have the same type of beribbon, uh, beribbon uh, streamers. Uh, this one I published quite recently, which was found in Gandhara. It is on pectoral around a statue of a Bodhisattva, depicting Bodhisattvas, most probably Maitreya, uh, Aulikuteshwara, and um, um, and Manjushri and, uh, and Buddhas. What is interesting for us is the depiction of the three Bodhisattvas, as I told you, Maitreya Manjushri and Aurukiteshwara. They all have the beribbon ribbons here. Right? And if you look at the Sasanian coins, like uh, as I said, Ardashi is the first and, and Shapur, they all have, I mean, instead of the Greek diadem, they have the beribbon uh, streamers or the periban uh, ribbons. So I come back to this, the cheerful Kubera dressed and drinking like a Persian noble, uh, like the Persian nobles being served by the Persian women in Persian attire with fluttering ribbons can be considered a self portrait of a rich Persian merchant. So what, I mean, if I, if I can hypothesize here, it is a portrait of a merchant, but supposed to be Kubera, uh, depicting one of the Chatra Maharajikas, the, the uh, Chatra Maharajika of the North. But he is dressed like a, like a Persian. And also, if you uh, look at the wine jar, it's a Persian wine jar, a Sassanian one. So, it's, which clearly shows the Persian presence as traders in Ajanta. So, these are the other paintings as well in cave number one. And again, you can see the jar, these are all Persian with this glazed, blue glazed uh, ware, and also the cups that he is holding, again, of the Persian context. Then I'm taking you to cave number 17, which is the last part of my talk today. And here uh, we have this uh, fabulous depiction, which was first interpreted by art historians as the story of Vesantara, but recently, I think correctly by Shingloff and Monica Sin, the story of Udayin and Gupta. Udayin uh, was a uh, courtier of Kapilavastu and messenger of King Suddhodana. He fell in love with Gupta, widow of a master's son in Shravasti. So here we have, we see the couple, they're very happy, holding a cup and drinking, um, and whole entourage is a palatial architecture. They are depicted as having happy time, ha having a happy time in their palace attended by many servants. One among them serving them wine is dressed as a Persian and holds a Sassanian type wine jar. His discreet intrusion into the picture is quite remarkable. And there is no reason him to be there. I mean, of course you can see they are dressed like Indians of that period, but he is not dressed like an Indian, but he's a Persian. I mean, you may criticize me if I say, he is the donor or the trader, the Persian uh, uh, trader who financed the painting. There are many other such depictions of Persians in the murals of Ajanta, 
reflecting the trading activities of the 5th to the 7th centuries CE of Perso Sassanians. Their presence in the Indian notion is noted by Vajrabodhi, the Indian Buddhist monk who later became an esoteric Buddhist teacher in Tang, China, who encountered 35 Persian vessels in Bozili, Beruela, in Sri Lanka. So here again, you have a Persian jar, a Persian merchant, dressed like a Persian and holding this jar. Again, a Persian. And then I am taking you to this one. All of you know, this is the descent of the Buddha uh, from Triathimsa heaven, um, um, uh, uh, having preached uh, Abhidhamma to his mother, who has become a god. Of course, he, he, she is shown, shown as a woman, but according to the tradition, um, Lalita Vistara and other texts, she became a man or a god. So he went there and stayed there for three months and seven days, preaching the uh, Dabidamma. And then the people in the earth got um, really upset because he was not returning. And then a message was sent and he decided to come down. And then three staircases were made, one for the Buddha in the middle and for Brahma and Nindra. And uh, so this is the story. But I am interested here is the, um, uh, the, the, of course, Buddha came down from the staircase and he reached the earth. And then on our right hand side, we have Utpalavarna, I mean, who came from the, uh, here you can see Utpalavarna on the elephant uh, back. She, she was uh, a nun or Bhikshuni who took the form of a Chakravarti um, to go, I mean, to be in the first place to greet the Buddha. And later when she greeted the Buddha, she took the, I mean, he or oh, he became she, that means Utvaruna became um, um, uh, a nun. So you can see her here. But I am interested in this part. If you look very carefully, these are the descent of the Buddha at Samkasha from the Thayatimsa. Uh, Thayatimsa, the delegation headed by the King Uddhyana has many non-Indian, but as Ethiopians or Egyptians. I mean, they are not Indians, as you can see very well. And they are most probably Egyptians or, Egypt, uh, or Ethiopians uh, who have come to, uh, I mean, as traders to Ajanta, to Maharashtra, they have given their, uh, I mean, donations, money uh, to, the, to these Buddhist complexes. So um, this is one of the ways of looking at the trade. I mean, of course, I didn't talk about text. I didn't talk about archaeological evidence. I only looked at today, looked at the, the, the depictions of traders uh, and their landmarks everywhere in India, in Sri Lanka, Southeast Asia, and especially in Maharashtra. So here you have the horsemen again from, uh, from uh, the most probably Egyptians. And again, you have, of course, uh, again from Ajanta, traders, they are drinking. Of course, they are not Indians, as you can see. So in conclusion, seafaring traders and caravan merchants were undoubtedly interested in the exchange of commodities to make profit. But they were also, as revealed by epigraphic and literary evidence, the earliest donors and important patrons of Buddhist establishments in South and Southeast Asia. The resources needed to build gigantic religious monuments would thus have been the result of both royal patronage and support from the fervent mercantile classes whose wealth was based on the flourishing inland and international trade centers located in the ports along the coast and the navigable rivers. Likewise, the spread of Buddhism and Buddhist iconographies in South Asia and Southeast Asia is closely connected with the growth of the maritime networks that facilitated the movement of Buddhist merchants, traveling monks, and teachers. As a result, Buddhist iconography is developed in a cross-fertilized context, ingeniously incorporating the sentiments and aesthetics of their respective traditions while um, um, uh, simulate, uh, simultaneously uh, stimulating the creation of new forms of art. It is those traces that enable us to understand the development of maritime networks. I thank you all very much.
I think Dr. I have enabled the chat now. People can put their questions in the chat now. Any questions, please? Dr. Kandan? I can see the comments <laughs> <laughs> on the screen, but they are not questions. Dr. Kandan? I can see a lot of uh, messages on the screen coming up, but not uh, questions. Abhishek Pandey has a question. Yes. Yeah, I think he should unmute himself and uh, ask. Okay. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I'm audible. Yeah. My question is related to Sufism. The way you explain. Sorry, I can't hear you. I, uh, the microphone is not close to your mouth. No, I can't hear no. you. No. Hello. Abhishek, if you want, type your mail, the question. Yeah. Well? Uh, uh, Abhishek. Uh, Abhishek, your microphone is closed. Abhishek? Hello, sir. Hello. Yes. Yes. yes sir, sir uh, the way you explain that uh, the, the, the expansion of trade support the extension of Buddhism, okay? So is there, any is there any correlation between the spread of Sufism through trade and uh, these, uh, uh, what, what do you say, pilgrimage migration? Is there any correlation? Uh, correlation with? Uh, um... I'm asking about Sufism. Sufism. Oh yeah, Sufism, okay. No, no, yes. uh, no, Abhishek, I'm, I'm not a specialist of it. Right, um, uh, because um, I, I looked at only the, the yeah, Buddhist and the other. Um, uh, of course, this is another subject that I'm not a specialist. Um, I'm sure they we had an impact, but uh, I don't want to tell you Sir, something I'm, I'm, incorrect. I'm asking about uh, Puru, Puru Madhikal. Uh, do you understand Hindi or not? You, you understand Hindi terms? Uh, not really well. If Sorry, you sir, speak sir. in Sanskrit, yes. Sorry, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Um, but you can write it and send it to me. Okay, sir. So can you send your mail in chat? Yeah, yeah uh, they will give it to you. Okay, sir. thank you, sir. Uh, thank sir, you, sir, I have a question. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Usha Vijay Lakshmi. So you yeah. had mentioned that uh, uh, Sri Lanka came from Tapropon, if I'm right. So that uh, refers to Tamraparani, right? And it is in... Yeah. Uh, it is in uh, Trinalveli actually, but yeah. at the time period you had mentioned, uh, South India was not exactly the that part of South India was not part of Sri Lanka. I mean Sri Lanka. I think it comes in sixth century BCE or something. So how is that Sri Lanka was associated with Tamraparni? Um, it's Tam. It's uh, uh, Taprobane mm -hmm. is the name given by the Greek and Latin writers to to Sri Lanka. Um, it appears as Taprobane as early as the second century BC. But the one hypothesis is that the name, of course, Sri Lanka was known as Taprobane, Lanka, Ceylon, Serendip, and all the all, I mean, different names, and also the country of the lions for the Chinese. Uh, but the name, uh, the Greek version, Taprobane derives from Tambapani. There's no doubt about it. But that this period, I'm talking about the second century, at this time, Sri Lanka was independent. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were 
periods from time to time Sri Lanka was occupied by South Indian um, uh, South Indians right so that's that's normal but I'm talking something reverse that for yeah. some time I think Sri Lanka had Tamrapani region but at this time that you have mentioned it was not so uh, Tamrapani was independent of Sri Lanka so that's what I'm saying but how oh, is that Sri Lankan so, uh, Oh, oh, right, right. No, this is a different question. But I am referring to the delegation. Um, this is in the Chronicle of uh, uh, Chronicle of Sri Lanka, the Mahavamsa. Uh, there are two two things happening. I, I wrote a lot about this. One is the the accidental voyage of a freedman, Anus Plokamus, coming to Sri Lanka, which is mentioned by Pliny. And then on the other side, we get another mention from uh, from the Sri Lankan Chronicle. The, the, the Mahavamsa saying that the delegation was sent from Sri Lanka to Romanuka, which is a Roman, Rome, right? So that's all. Um, I'm not engaging myself with the, <laughs> of that. So it's just a, just a point which, which is interesting is that uh, um, I'm all, it's, it's a way of explaining why you find Roman motives on a stupa, Buddhist stupa like that. I mean, it's just out of um, out of the blue. I mean, it's just there, and it had a great impact of the the early stupa ayaka sculptures. I, I totally agree with you, madam. Thank you. Sir. <laughs> yes, there are so many questions coming. If can, somebody can read. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Usha, 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 Sanjay. Sir, Professor Usha, Kannal. Yeah. Are you are you there? Yes, yes I was. Uh -huh. muted Please, uh, I, uh, I, was I was kept Please. out of the discussion. May uh, I request you to select a few interesting questions and then? Yes. Uh, uh, so because since, since we I was are not in the discussion at all, I could not see these things. I was muted. I think by mistake. But anyway. Uh, before I, I thought that I, I should have thanked Dr. Bhupparaji for such a uh, captivating lecture and uh, uh, making us realize that what we would have missed if the lecture would not have been rearranged by the organizers. It was an amazing lecture and I'm sure people must be looking forward to the further discussion. Uh, there are comments, not many questions, but uh, Jetavana episode and said those points were of gold but all PMCs are of silver. I think these details can be discussed independently, but because they do not have any direct, uh, uh, direct, direct connection with the central thesis of Dr. Boparachi. Uh, but uh, Kanel, if you want, I can just very quickly uh, answer that question because it's in the, um, 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 uh, in the Nidhanakata, it says the Danata Pindika use gold coins. So if this happened re really during the time of the Buddha, if we date him, I mean, to the fifth or the sixth or the seventh century BCE, there were no gold coins in Sri Lanka. Mm. At, at the time when this was written by Buddha Gosha in Sri Lanka, in the fifth century, there were gold coins. So this is very interesting when how careful we should be looking at the literary evidence. They are referring to something which happened thousand years ago, okay. but using the data that they have at the time, they wrote the uh, wrote the text. So in that sense, so they can't be gold coins. I mean, they look like punch mark coins. So they could be. They have to be silver coins. Yeah. Uh, there is a question by uh, Mr. Abhijit Kumar. He thanks you for the lecture and uh, he asks whether you could please elaborate on how Sri Lankan were impacted by Ajanta painting and what trade route you see they followed. Oh, yes, it's quite interesting that, I mean, I, I didn't enter into that because I was mainly concentrating on Maharashtra. Uh, there were a lot of contacts with Maharashtra and Sri Lanka. Uh, especially recently, I published this in an article, but I can send all of that. We are uh, in the same stupa that I showed you, um, about 125 about the terrace, they found a niche deliberately made and there was a plaque. And this plaque has to come from Maharashtra because you have the Buddha in the middle and two Bodhisattvas on either side, which is the Yogi Avalokiteshwara and the Princely Avalokiteshwara. Uh, 
uh, they have certainly, I mean, there are so many evidence, so many inscriptional evidence for, from Sri Lanka referring to traders going to Gujarat, going to Barukacha, and going to uh, Karachi. And um, so they were mainly traders. And, and of course, they are traders. They are, I mean, um, um, identified as, uh, um, as mariners, right? Navika. So that's the word which comes quite often. So they have used the land routes. I mean, they must have come to Manthai or to other sites that I have excavated in the past, and they reached the, uh, the capitals of Sri Lanka. The connections, of course, people have insisted upon the connections between Andhra Pradesh and Sri Lanka, but people seem to forget the connections between Maharashtra Maharashtra and Gujarat. Gujarat is extremely important, as you, saw, as you know, Professor Kanel, uh, the recent book uh, that published by Ingo Strau, um, um, uh, that they get so many, so many traders who were uh, uh, trading uh, with, uh, uh, with the Red Sea, who came from Gujarat, and also who came from, um, who came from Maharashtra. So this is something that we need to explore more and more. And apart from the scriptural and also literary evidence, now we have also uh, iconography, iconographic evidence. Okay. Dr. Priyanka Gupta inquires whether there is any evidence of literary or archaeological uh, evidence related with astronomical knowledge, which was used by the travelers during their voyage. Not for the early period, as you know, the early. Uh, so this is something that we people have discussed. The earliest traders they used the coastal navigation, not the direct navigation. So they, they, I mean, they were, uh, I mean, just the coast. I mean, they, they were traveling, seeing the coast, and uh, I mean, uh, also examining birds and also little bit of stars, but not. But by the fourth century, things really developed. You can you have the di direct navigation from uh, from the Red Sea to India directly to Patinam or directly to um, uh, to all the sites in uh, Gujarat and also in Maharashtra. So by that time, of course, during the Arabic period, we have ample of evidence uh, using astronomy uh, for the navigation. But people are now working. It was there even as early as the fourth century. Mm -hmm. They knew about it, and people have worked on that. Hi, yes, it answers his question. Uh, Mr. Dhairya Vyas, he says, uh, you have mentioned the Ethiopians and Egyptians. They were depicted in the paintings. Are they only seen in the painting? Ah, or are there any literary works discussing their presence? Yeah, that's the, the, the problem. I mean, of course, Professor Karnal knows about it. The absence of uh, Chronicles India is a huge problem. So we have to depend on the inscriptional evidence. They don't, I mean, they don't say they were, they were Egyptians or Ethiopians. Now, for example, uh, um, if you take the, uh, the, uh, the Tamil Sangam literature, they are all referred as Yonas. So Yona, Yonakas, that means the foreigners. Same thing in in, uh, in Gandhara. So it could be they could be Greeks, they could be Romans, but I to my I may be wrong, but to my knowledge, um, I have worked amply on it. But you don't find a specific reference to references to Ethiopians or the Egyptians, but that's something very evident from the frame number seventeen that uh, and over, that they have to be Ethiopians and also the one that I showed uh, from Amaravati because the way they are dressed and you can compare they are dressed with the contemporary um, um, the, the uh, results from the excavations in Egypt, uh, Myosormos and other places. So that is something, but to my knowledge, there are no literary evidence as early as that designating uh, the Ethiopians and Egyptians not even in Sri Lanka, and also in the other descriptions I referred. Um, I'll be very happy if somebody corrects me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Srikant Ganvir and uh, Dr. Virag Son Sarke from Deccan College, who are uh, responsible for the excavations of Nagardhan, yeah. they say that they have found torpedo jars uh, in the in the Vakataka levels, in the site around, uh, around 5th, 6th century. Yeah. Uh, so the depiction of Persians at Ajanta at the same time, and this evidence goes well, yeah. uh, uh, hand in hand. 
So they are they are uh, endorsing your uh, readings. Yeah, it's uh, a wonderful remark. I'm very grateful data. to them. Yeah, I'm very grateful to them. Yes. Uh, I I'm sorry, uh, a gentleman from Bhutan. Uh, correct me if I uh, pronounce your name wrongly. Ko Koyetan uh, Tinle. He wants to know: Would you mind further elaboration on Nalanda tradition and the traders? Oh, that's uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, <laughs> there were so many, uh, of course, uh, Nalanda. I mean, of course, the whole of Bihar and also the Middle Gangetic Valley with all the tributaries. They were very active traders, like the traders in Gujarat and Maharashtra. There's no doubt about that. Uh, um, I mean, you get ample, uh, plenty of evidence from Sri Lankan literature, from the chronicles and also inscriptional evidence referring to, uh, to traders coming from Nalanda. Recently, I published an article of the, I mean, if the gentleman is from Bhutan, he would understand me, this satsa, you know, this, um, the votive plaques that you find in British monasteries. And they were, there were 12 of them found in Anuradhapura during the, during the excavations which I published, and they come from Nalanda. So there are plenty of references in Sri Lankan chronicles referring to the traders going to Nalanda and also Buddhist, I mean, Buddhist monks and Buddhist pilgrims going there. So it's a very important evidence. I mean, as I told you, when you when you speak about the the, the connections, commercial trade connections uh, with different regions of India, I mean, Pogandara, Gujarat, Maharashtra, and then Karnataka, I mean, uh, Karnataka area, and then Andhra Pradesh, and as well as the Middle Gangetic Valley, Bihar, they are very, very important. So there are plenty, plenty of, if, if the gentleman um, uh, writes to me, I can send him some references to, to the, uh, the wonderful evidence that you get um, with the Bihar. Bihar that's, that's great. That's great. That would be wonderful. Uh, there are so many questions, Doctor. <laughs> yes. He asks that uh, uh, he requests you to please elaborate on the role of Sri, Sri Lanka in fostering its own network of Buddhist connections through the relic cult and transmission of Tantric Buddhism. Yes, uh, again, very, uh, I mean, of course, this question uh, uh, needs a detailed answer. Um, I'll just tell you very quickly, uh, at, that mo at this moment, we are doing a huge GIS project in South India and Sri Lanka, trying to uh, plot all the um, uh, images of Pavlikateshwar and Tara in South India and Sri Lanka. It shows us that from the 8th century until the arrival of the Cholas, the Mahayanism was, although we call it the Theravada Buddhism, Mahayanism was very popular in Sri Lanka. So the reason why Vajrabodhi, followed by Amoga Vajra, came to Sri Lanka, because they knew the Abhegiriya and many other monastic sites had esoteric Buddhist texts. And it says when Vajrabodhi got into these Persian ships and went to the Tang Dynasty to China, he collected all these Mahayana texts and went to the Tang Dynasty. So um, uh, this is absolutely new for Sri Lankan, uh, Sri Lankan Buddhism, but uh, what I am saying now, uh, a book will come out with my colleagues. It's a joint project that I launched with my colleague from Berkeley University, um, Lou Lancaster, um, about the diffusion of Mayanism, esoteric Buddhism, uh, from the seventh century, from Kanchipuram to Sri Lanka, and from Sri Lanka to Southeast Asia. The same way you get the evidence from uh, Southeast Asia, I'm referring to, especially to Cambodia and to Java, Indonesia, where you find their sculptures and traditions in Sri Lanka. And also the whole question of what we call the meditation centers like Padanagaras that you find in Sri Lanka, they are also found in Java. So this is something we really need to bear in mind, uh, the, 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 the connection of Mahayana Buddhism and the association of traders. In Maharashtra, as you know, uh, Professor Kanel, the Ashtamahabhya can be dated to 5th, 6th century. But in Sri Lanka, the Avalokiteshwara cults comes a little later, around the 7th century, and there are hundreds and hundreds of images of Avalokiteshwara, Manjushri, Tara in Sri Lanka. And it's the same way they are connected with Southeast Asia 
uh, and also this is what we call the diffusion. If you find the trade route uh, took by um, to, um, to uh, Amogavajra, um, uh, and it is exactly going towards Southeast Asia and, and to China. This is a very short answer, but the, and it's a wonderful question. And uh, if one day, if I come to Bombay, I will talk about it. <laughs> okay. uh, Mr. Aro, um, may I uh, uh, request Professor Kannan to you to select a question because we are running uh, out are, of there time. There are only two questions. Okay. You okay. can enter it in there. Yeah. Uh, okay. one, one is about his work. That is a very simple question. This one uh, inquires about the representation of ships on hero stones of Western India. If there is a representation of ships. Oh, yes, plenty. <laughs> yes. Uh, represent, I mean, uh, the, they start from Sanchi, as you know, I mean, Sanchi Stupa. And also in many uh, Jataka stories, the one that I, the Simhala Jataka, and also in cave number one, there are so many Jataka stories involved with the mariners and you get the ships. Uh, there's a wonderful article written by uh, Shinglov, uh, um, as yes. you know, of the Kannal knows very well, uh, about the ships found in the paintings of Maharashtra, which I didn't talk because his work is fabulous, uh, what he did. And there are so many representations of ships. I mean, I'm not talking about the other ships found in Andhra Pradesh and also in Sri Lankan sculptures. Uh, yes, uh, not only traders, but also there are there there are ships. Yeah. Uh, there are also inquiries about your work, whether it can be found, and uh, uh, people are uh, keen to know your uh, idea also. Now you can you can talk to Dr. Deshpande and think about it. But yeah. people uh, yeah. do want. I'm, I'm happy to tell you that um, Professor Bapuraji is kind enough to allow us to preserve his uh, speech in our uh, YouTube channel, and then that can be made available. Um, that is really wonderful. This speech, uh, it it's not enough to listen to this speech only once. We need to see it again and again because there are so many uh, interesting things. I, uh, shall we, shall we uh, conclude now, Dr. Deshpande? Yes, we can conclude, sir, with your uh, oh. few remarks. Because most of the questions have been answered. If you allow me, there is only one question. I think we need not keep it out. Uh, okay. Somadeep uh, from, from M wants to know that we see many mural paintings on the temples of Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Yeah. Do such paintings reflect their international trade and mindset of Brahmanical society? I wonder, anyway, I leave it to Professor uh, uh, Bhaparachi to answer this question, but I think these, these murals are very late murals. Yes, I didn't. Um, of course, Professor Kannal knows about them, and also I worked a lot in Tamil Nadu with my colleagues, uh, like Professor Rajan and others, both looking at the paintings. Uh, uh, especially, I mean, from the Chola period, or from the Pandey period onwards, there were a lot of trade connections. And also, there are also depictions of traders on those paintings, and also especially in Karnataka, uh, I mean, places like Hampi and all the, all the other paintings, there are plenty of them. And also, I mean, I didn't talk about the representations in, uh, in also in Southeast Asia, especially in Java, um, uh, in Borobudur, and also paintings of Pagan, um, I'm, I'm very keen on paintings because they give us so much information about the people, about the transactions, about their beliefs, about philosophies, and also about the printing. Yes, of course, you get more information. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Bokharaj. I, yeah. I, I think that this is perhaps the most eventful period in the history of India. Yes. Uh, so much is happening. So many outsiders are coming. I, I think this is, this is a real cultural turmoil in the history of this country. And you have depicted it with so many details. Uh, uh, I, I uh, know that people like Moti Chandra or people like B.S. Agrawal in their Sartava, they have written a lot about this period and uh, giving, giving so, so many uh, interesting details. Uh, Text like Samarai Chakatha of Harivadra Suri also gives us very interesting details. But the visual representation of all these uh, 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 events, all, 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 all the things which have been happening, it was, was really amazing. Uh, 
we talk about the intrinsic methodology, but the way you picked up things, the picked up details from the actual sculpture and related it with the events and the, and, and, and the references contemporaneous to it was really amazing. I think it was one of the most exciting lectures that, that, that we attended. And we are really thankful to Asiatic Society for, for uh, organizing this. And of course, uh, uh, very, very thankful to Dr. Bokurachi for delivering this lecture and also allowing us to record it because we must have it in our record. Uh, mm, uh, there, there, there are so many things which are coming to my uh, mind, the Simala, the Mahakata, the Tamra Lipti. I think some discussion was there. Uh, the Ashtabhaya Taran, that's some of, some, of, some of the very interesting, very, very minute, but very interesting things that Ashtabhaya Taran is seldom seen outside Maharashtra. And he uh, uh, presented us with, with, with that uh, interesting panel from, from uh, Eastern India. Then the details of Simula Vadana, the Mahajanaka, his, uh, it, it, was, it was a very, very perceptive uh, lecture. It could, it could notice some most interesting details and the way these details were interpreted was really very educative, even for uh, the people who have been working in this area for decades. Thank you very much, Dr. Bokorachi, uh, again and again. And thank you, Asiatic Society, for inviting me to attend this lecture and be a part of it. Thank you so much for the comments. Thank you. Our pleasure too. May I request uh, Renu? Renu, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, please, please pass the vote of thanks. Though, hello? Yes. yes. On behalf of Kane Committee and Asiatic Society of Mumbai, I take this opportunity on thanking Professor Arthur Bhaktachi and Professor Deepa Kanal to take time out and share their views and thoughts on such an interesting topic and also to address all the questions that were put up in the chat box. I also thank all the participants for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was much. a great pleasure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks. Must the lecture,